I never set out to be a dating expert, and I certainly never set out to go on so many dates. It was never. It wasn't a challenge. <laughs> yeah, why do I believe you about that? <laughs> yeah, it wasn't a marathon. It wasn't a challenge. It wasn't like a personal plague fun goal of some sort. It was a complete and utter accident. I had been studying men already for several years, and when I started dating, I just thought, well, I already work at a corporation where my job is studying men and understanding men and learning about partnership. So because I'm so fluent in men, I'm going to be a man magnet. It's going to take me five seconds. I was in a long-term marriage for for 12 years, and when I came out of that marriage, I thought, I'm not going to be single for very long. Ha, ha, Mm -hmm. ha, ha, ha. Mm -hmm. It took me a decade, Michelle. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it took me a decade, and I didn't mean to write a book. I, like I said, I didn't mean to go on that many dates, but I didn't know it at the time, but it turned out to be first date number 51. First date, or 53, excuse me, 54. It's important to know. So date number 54 <laughs> was <laughs> so horrendously bad, Michelle. Oh. It was it was book worthy. It was oh. blog, blog post worthy. And at the time, I had all of these girlfriends who were married and were grumbling about how boring marriage was and how exciting my life must be as a single person. You know how exciting it is, right, Michelle? Yes, yes. (laughs) And so I decided for my married lady friends that were complaining that I would write one short story about this terrible, terrible date, the worst date of my life. And, (laughs) And a blog was born. So that's how I sort of accidentally got underway of the part tell-all part of my journey is I actually chronicled my dates. And what was so great about it is I got to see my own growth and development and see the glaring mistakes that I made, the things that I Mm -hmm. should probably never repeat. And there were some things that we do by nature that I was doing that, that weigh us down, that get in the way of ourselves that waste a lot of time, and they're natural to do. They they make sense in the moment. And so I was capturing all those things as well to help women be more efficient and uh, use our time and heart better. So that's how mm-hmm. I kind of got started and underway was I was just in the m- middle of the mess of it, really. And, and it took me, yeah, it took me 121 first dates to get to him. <laughs> Yeah, and I know to a lot of women sounding that are listening to listening to this, that probably sounds as about as much fun as having a mouthful of root canals, right? Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. I am so, not the person that would say dating was always really fun. No. Yeah. It's not always really fun. Yeah, especially first dates, because first dates in particular can be incredibly challenging. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so over what span of time were these 121 first dates, Wendy? Well, after my marriage ended, I did what I did before I got married. I did the the natural thing that women do. I said yes to the first handsome man in front of me who was paying attention. And I hadn't done a very good job of vetting to see if he and I were compatible for the long haul. So we were together for about a year and a half. And then after he and I split, the next cute one was along, and he was there for four years. And then after that, I thought, you know what? You need to just stop. You need to stop what you're doing. You need to really pay attention to who you are and what you need and what you're looking for and look beyond how cute is he <laughs> and mm-hmm. and date. Date more than one person and, and see how does this compare against what I'm actually looking for for the long haul. So... The reason it took me so long was because I, over that process, learned who I was, and I wasn't willing to compromise that. You know, a lot. Mm-hmm. I hear a lot of women say things like, "Oh, you have to dumb yourself down. You're, too, you know, you're too much. You're too powerful. You're too strong." And I wasn't willing to do that. So mm-hmm. over the over the time, I could really start to shift and hold my own be myself, be authentic, 
and and see if I could meet a man with big enough hands to handle me because I'm a handful, right? <laughs> and, and, and and the other part of it is I I didn't want to change anybody, so I was unwilling right. to try and pick a man based on potential. I didn't want to change him, so all of those things added up to a lot of quick meetings. So I would say to answer your question, the bulk of my dating really started, uh, let's see, around 09. Uh, mm-hmm. Date number nine was in 09. And I met Dave at the very, very beginning of 13. So a full 9, 10, 11, a full three years really to get mm-hmm. the bulk of those 121 hammered out. Yeah. So that clarity about what you really wanted and not being willing to compromise and then, as I say, not taking on the fixer-uppers, which doesn't ever go well. <laughs> those, yeah. were some key, those were some key things for you. Yeah. In, and as you got to know yourself better and got that clarity that you really wanted to uh, be wise and smart about um, your dating at this stage in life, helped you to be able to eliminate, it sounds like, the wrong men fairly early on in the process. Because I always say one of the keys to being with the right guy is not being tangled up with the wrong guy. And a guy can be the wrong guy for you for so many different reasons. But like you said, it can be very tempting, particularly if we're fresh out of a relationship and kind of in a vulnerable place or if it's been a while since we've dated or someone comes along that's really cute and there's chemistry or we're flattered to jump right in with both feet without recognizing we haven't really, really paid enough attention to um, the red flags or what might not work in the context of a, a dating relationship. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And chemistry will have us do the dumbest things, you know? Oh, I know. We, we lose have, our minds. We do. We have to catch ourselves. Can I tell on myself for one of my favorite moments? Oh, please, yes. One of my dates and I were very mismatched, but he was very handsome and very charming, and he liked me. I felt very beautiful in front of him. I was his type, and he thought I was very charming, and so we had this amazing, amazing time together. I would have never set this date up on my own. I actually, this was one of the five I got through one of those national matchmaker companies. Completely wildly mismatched five dates, right? Mm-hmm. And, and I, at the time, was 43 years old. I don't have children. And you might assume at 43, if I didn't have them, I didn't have them on purpose. I, I'm not a mother type in that way. I am not great with small children. Teenagers I'm fine with. But small children, Mm -hmm. not good. This man had six children under the age of 18. Six. (laughs) (laughs) I'm just laughing. (laughs) And I remember saying, I remember seeing the words just come right out of my mouth. Oh, I love children. (laughs) 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 The good news is when I finally came to my senses by the end of the date, he said, I'd really like to see you again. And I said, I'd really like that too. But you know what? I honestly have to tell you, I lied earlier. I'm so sorry. I don't think we're a match because I don't love children. But you were so charming. I wanted to. <laughs> and he loved that. He was. He took it with stride and we didn't make another date. But yes, exactly. Chemistry makes us crazy. Yeah, it's it's tricky sometimes, and even when we're a little bit more mature, it's still tricky to balance what I like to say, the head, the heart, and the hormones. And yeah. when it comes to that chemistry, we can completely lose our minds. I love that story. That's so cute. Thanks for sharing that. You're welcome. So, Wendy, I want to ask you this. What do you consider to be the best first date question? One of the things you want to do is you want to learn something unique about this person and not throw them off guard because you're going to dive into the interview set of questions. So Mm -hmm. I like the, so I love the question, what do you love about your life? If you can tap into their Mm -hmm. passion, what are you passionate about in your life is a a variation on that, right? You, 
you're going to put them in a positive state because now they're going to focus on the positive, what they love and what's working. And what's so great about what do you love about your life will still give you quality information if you're going to try and sneakily sort him in or out of your life. It'll give you quality information about what his life is about, but it's not coming from a place of, what do you do? And, oh, you're a manager. How many people do you manage? That Mm is, ugh, right? Yeah, what a great question that is. I love that question. Yeah, I really do, too. And literally, I have spent entire dates going back and forth. What else do you love about your life? What else are you passionate about? What Who's your favorite underdog? Just those types of more human spirit-based questions will really draw out what they care about, what's important to them, and in their opinions, you can see what matters. Yep. Well, and also I think one of the cool things about that question is they're talking, like you said, about things they're passionate about and things that make them happy. And so you're generating these good vibrations and feelings in the date where sometimes conversations on a first date can be awkward and spiraling downward into people talking about mundane, depressing, or you feel like you're back in college or at a university going, what's your major? And, um, you know, that kind of thing. (laughs) Yeah, or even worse, you're now discussing what fell apart in their marriage for three hours. Oh, Oh, no. (laughs) Oh, yeah, that's a bad one. Very bad one. (laughs) That's a bad one. So, Wendy, you obviously were very um, wise in this process of this 121 first dates. So I know you've learned a lot from that and also from all of the men you've interviewed and talked to and seen on panels over the years. So if you could tell women one thing about picking a partner, what would that be? I would tell her to make sure that she liked him, that she Mm. respected him, that who he showed up as on that very first date, as is, was someone that she liked, that she could support, that she could get behind, that she could stand next to and be proud. Now, I know that most of your listeners, we're not 20 anymore. If we were 20, we could pick on potential. But we're talking about grown men here. And so, I, like I said, I never wanted to change my partner. And it's one of the things that a lot of women do, it's very common for us to pick the parts that we love and say yes and commit and then get to work on the parts that we don't love. (laughs) Or or we pick him on on who he says he wants to become, but he hasn't become that yet. We don't know if he's ever going to become that. And we think, well, I'm, I'm a good woman. I'm strong. I can get behind him and support him and have him become amazing. I wouldn't recommend it. Like I said, unless you're 20, I wouldn't recommend. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend a project or a not quite there yet. Pick someone that you already respect, because I think respect is the most important thing that a woman needs for a partner. I think the most important thing a man needs for a woman, well, respect is in there too, but also adoration. But I really think we need to respect them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think this is such wise advice because I think it's very easy to get trapped in that potential trap where we can kind of fantasize and say, well, he would be the perfect guy if, or if this were tweaked or that were changed, then this could really work well. But that's not really dealing in reality. And the truth is that men don't want to feel like they're a fixer-upper project, and they're going to sense that if you're trying to change him, and most men that are a little more established uh, or maybe have a few more miles on their uh, miles down, a few more miles down the road, a little older, they're going to be strong in their own identity and their own personality and their own characteristics and habits, and they're going to resent you if they feel like you're trying to mold them into your ideal man. Yeah, because they don't do that so much to us. That's more something that we do to them much more than they do to us. They tend to buy the whole package. And it's partly why it takes men, some of the reasons why, it takes men longer to commit 
because they're mm-hmm. actually assessing the whole thing and looking at all the parts going, yeah, can I accept that? And and I'm not saying that it took me 121 first dates to get to the perfect man. He's perfect for me, but he's also human. So mm-hmm. were there parts that I saw that I wish might have been different? Well, well maybe not, but <laughs> the things was like, huh, is that the most ideal thing? And even if there were things that I wanted different, which I can't think of one off the top of my head right now, but if there were, which I'm sure there were, or things that, you know, I I would have preferred a different way, then what I had to really do is look to see, can I, I, I basically acted like a man. Could I fully accept this human as is? And the thing I'd rather have different, just completely let it go. And it's mm-hmm. a testament to that I really did it because I can't recall anything. So whatever mm-hmm. was there, yeah, I let it go. Like this is mm-hmm. the whole package. This is who he is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So as you know, I had a very, very long and winding path to journey my love to love myself. And I used to joke around saying that I was going to write a book called Dating for Decades, chronicling mm-hmm. all of my dating mishaps and misadventures. And at one point, I thought it might end up being like a 26-volume set, like the Encyclopedia Britannica or something. (laughs) And so uh, I think I could feel that many volumes. So I'm sure you and I could share stories and have a a lot of really great uh, material. But, you know, I'm just wondering, Wendy, because for for women that are out there on this journey and on this path, and it is taking time like it did for both you and I, it can be kind of discouraging and it can be kind of disheartening and sometimes it can it can be challenging to keep the faith and yet somehow you managed to keep going, and I managed to keep going, although there were times I wanted to throw my hands up in the air and and throw in the towel mm-hmm. um, I'm just kind of wondering what advice you could give. For women that are in that space where they're just kind of going, really, really, I mean, do I have to really keep doing this? <laughs> yeah. You don't. You totally don't. You could be single. I know women who are perfectly <laughs> happily, happily single. But, yeah, mm-hmm. I completely hear you. And you said it. I mean, sometimes you felt like throwing in the towel. Sometimes I felt like throwing in the towel. And it's going to happen. You're you're going to tell yourself stories that aren't true. I told myself a story once that maybe after 78 or however many it was at the time, after those many dates, maybe I don't deserve my man. Maybe what my purpose is is to teach women how to keep standing in the face of it. Maybe mm-hmm. I don't get mine. I Maybe the other women get theirs. And I stopped telling that story, right? That's not a very empowering story. But your accurate. You're not always going to be 100% on, 100% in great shape. What I recommend for women and men is to get a dating buddy or maybe two or three dating buddies. And that would be someone else who's single, who doesn't love being single, who actually, like you, feels like you're meant to be in a partnership. You want someone on the same page as you. Married people, unless they're a coach, are no good at this. Single right. people who love being <laughs> right. Single people right. who love being single are no good at this because they're going to give you terrible advice that doesn't resonate with where you are. So I'll tell you what I use dating buddies for, and I'll tell you what you might want to consider using a dating buddy for. I used a dating buddy to tell me the truth. <laughs> Mm-hmm. About this is a wild I, idea, huh? Yeah, <laughs> when it wasn't the date anymore, and that it's actually me. <laughs> my friend Robert actually sat me down one day and said, "My love, you're just complaining about this date you finished. Yeah, it wasn't him. It's you. And by the way, you've been like this for two and a half weeks." And I feel really sorry for anyone who's on the books with you because they're never going to meet you. They're going to meet this crusty, crispy, burnt out, slightly annoyed version of (laughs) the least popular version of you. So Mm. can you please 
get off the merry-go-round. I'll watch you while you're off the ride, but get off the merry-go-round of dating for at least two weeks. And he said to me, I want you to do something in those two weeks that's going to restore you. Because dating isn't linear. It doesn't have a beginning, a middle, and an end that's predictable. So I want you to stop dating, and I want you to, I don't know, I'll send you my sewing machine if you want. You can sew a beautiful skirt for yourself, use a really lush fabrics and a great pattern that you love. That would have a beginning, middle, or end. Or take a cooking class and bake something amazing. Don't work on your to-do work projects, but do something that will fill your heart that has a beginning and a middle and an end, and at the end of it, you'll have a finished product, even if it's edible. (laughs) (laughs) And it was great advice. And so a dating buddy can be straight with you and tell you, hey, it's, it's you, and take a break. But then he was also that same buddy who was accountable for saying, hey, put down the Hagen dazs and get back online because it's been three weeks and you're done now. So they can they can be accountable for getting you off and accountable for getting you back on. Plus, they can help heal your heart. They can see your pain. They can you you have someone to witness the atrocities of badness of the dates, right? You have someone to say, "No, baby, you're amazing. You're really really an amazing woman who deserves." what she's after and and this guy just he just said these things this is not true so mm-hmm. they're great for all of that and you can be great for them that way back mhm yeah so that was really one. that was really beautifully said and uh for me it was Ben and Jerry's and those boys I still have I still have them with me on my hips you know <laughs> I would curl. I would curl. Those me are a too. couple of hard. Those are a couple of hard boys to shake. <laughs> right, the long decade, right? A long couple yeah. of decades with the boys. <laughs> exactly. Curled up on the couch with Ben and Jerry. It's not a and good. And whatever thing. rerun that was on at the time. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So um, I know you've told us a little bit about this already in terms of your own journey, Wendy, and the fact that you had this clarity about what you wanted. You had this commitment to yourself to not settle and that you were willing to keep moving forward and um, going through this process. So why do you think it took so long? Because, again, I think one of the things that we – see and feel is that love should just happen easily and naturally and fall into place. I thought that. I thought, now why is it that it seems like that happens for so many people? But it sure didn't happen that way for me. Yeah. I I don't know. I mean, I don't... One, Like I said, one of the reasons is I'm a hard match. So as my grandfather told me as I was separating from my husband in my mid-30s, you're no spring chicken! <laughs> Like grandpa, it's gonna Thanks, be okay. Grandpa. Women over thirty-five do get a husband. It's it's true. It's it's gonna turn out for me. And I'm not, you know, like a lot of women worry. I'm not from thirty-five to forty-five when I was dating. That's that's a regular range. That's a nice young age. At the time, I didn't think so, but it really is a great range to be dating. But I had a mental block around it, thinking I was too old and. I was a size 16, 18. I thought I was too fat. And I think if I would have gotten out of my own way without changing my age and changing my weight, but changing my mind about it, things might have gone smoother because there probably were times where, I don't know, I just thought, well, he couldn't possibly, you know, which may or may not have been true. And like I said, I think it took me that long because... It's not a linear process, and there were plenty of men who I could have walked away with, but they just weren't Mm -hmm. the right match for me. And really taking the time to drill down and figure out what it was that could leave me with a shot of happy for the rest of my life, Mm -hmm. um, it was was quite a process, and I, I wasn't willing... To stop. Also, my first marriage, my my long term first marriage, was a really good marriage. We're, we're still really good friends to this day. There was just one fundamental thing that didn't work about it, but everything else did. So I think having a history of having a really great, great long marriage, pr- 
probably didn't make it easier on the man. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So it's like, oh, yeah. not as good as Mr. Newman was next, right? <laughs> right. So that probably didn't help. But yeah, yeah, it, it took what it took. And yeah. I, kept, I kept going partly because I knew I only needed one. And one of the things I did to help uh, mitigate the situation is I would meet men right away. That probably had something to do with the higher number. But I tried it both ways. I tried not meeting right away and trying to vet them a little bit to save my time mm-hmm. on a bad date, you know. So I'd try and mm-hmm. write back and forth and talk on the phone and get to know them first. That didn't turn out to be the smartest move. That actually sort of backfired and is not an efficient way and and had me had me get really connected to men, you know, if you're writing to them back and forth and talking on the phone for weeks on end and then you finally meet, if you're not his type, it's over in two seconds and you're you're really connected. And that happened to me time and again till I realized, stop doing that. Um, so that was part of the time wasting that I did in this process. Mm-hmm. But mostly how I kept going is I stayed focused on what was working and I didn't dwell on what wasn't working other than to take note that it wasn't working. And what I got better at and better at and better at is I stopped listening to my inner critic because what would happen is after I would go on a date, now, Michelle, I want to check in with you and see if this happened for you, but when I would go on a date, I'd have a great date, right? And I'd come home from the date and I'd be very excited about him. And then the next day, I'd be very excited about him, but then my inner critic would start running through all of the ways that I might have blown it. Like, Mm, why did I tell that crazy story about my family? And I laughed too loud. And did I talk too much? And I should have never worn those pants. I think my fat roll showed as I was sitting at the (laughs) counter, right? Like, it's, it's endless. Did that ever happen to you? Oh, yeah. I think this is so common for us as women. I mean, we can just drive ourselves crazy analyzing every teeny tiny little nuance and and word and what we wore and how our hair looked and, where our, and what our makeup was like. And, and uh, we can just absolutely drive ourselves crazy um, going over all of that in our minds. And then if he doesn't call for whatever reason or we think... <laughs> You know, then we yes. come up with all of these reasons and ideas in our mind as to why that that it, that it didn't happen or why it didn't work out or why he didn't call. And I can remember a story at one point. Um, I don't even remember where I heard this, but it was a story about a woman who had gone out with a man and things had gone well. She felt like there was some chemistry and some interest on both sides. And at the end of the date, he said, well, I'll give you a call. And she waited by the phone. (laughs) He didn't call. He didn't call. Of course, she's going through this process of going through every detail, rehashing every nuance of the date, what could have gone wrong, what she could have said, what she could have done differently. Did he like this? Did he like that? And she went through this and was going through this self-torture And at one point, she decided that she was going to talk to her brother about it. She's like, okay, I'm just going to get a male perspective. I'm going to talk to my brother about it. And she said, you know, she described what had happened, and she said, and he hasn't called. And she said, what does that mean? And her brother said, it means he didn't call. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I I know it's not so easy to just say that, but I think that we can drive ourselves crazy, and I think that if we can just be in a place where we can relax a little bit more and just be in the moment and not be so focused on what's happened in our past or what might happen in the future with any given person, especially in the early stages of dating, it can be so much more enjoyable, and yet that self-consciousness that can happen both while we're on the date and then kind of obsessing over the details of the date afterwards can really about take the joy, sap the joy and the fun out of the whole experience. Yeah, the obsessing after the date was the thing that almost had me stop dating. 
And mm-hmm. it wasn't until I could see that piece and how tortured I was that I decided that I could just thank my inner critic for sharing all of her brilliant insights with me about every detail and that, yeah, I wasn't going to listen to that anymore. And mm-hmm. that if he calls, he calls. And, and if he doesn't, I will be bummed out. But if he doesn't, he is, and it's easy to say now when I have, you know, my heart isn't at stake at this like it is when you're dating, but I would try to remember that what he's telling me by not calling is he's not my man. And how I know that is my man calls back. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And and really, it's a gift when we find out early. Yes, absolutely. It's a gift when we find out early. And allowing for that space to see if he does call back um, is one of the early ways that you can begin to see if he could be the man for you. And yes. if we don't allow that space and if our obsessing over the date causes us to get into the pursuing mode or whatever, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, if we enter into the golden age of stalking or whatever, then um, <laughs> then it has a you know it has a detrimental effect overall. Um, and part of this, I think, comes from our own inner belief and confidence that we are worthy of being loved and cherished and adored exactly as we are right now. And that's a big deal. That that was a really big deal for me to get because I, too, had that inner critic, you know, you're too old, you're too fat, you're not enough this, you're not enough that, all the good ones are taken, all the things that were going on yeah. and all this it's crazy brutal, talk right? and Oh, it's brutal. I mean, I say, you know, I often say I shot myself so in the foot so many times, it's a wonder I can walk mm-hmm. because my I was self-sabotaging in so many ways. And I, like you, I had to learn how to speak back to that inner critic. I'm like, okay, she's already speaking to me. I may as well talk back. Yep. So I would thank her for wanting to keep me safe and that I know she's trying to protect me in my heart and she doesn't want me to get hurt and thank you very much for sharing and I've taken under advisement what she's <laughs> saying and I choose to um, redirect that in another way and, and take another point of view and then I would I would like say, you know, you've really been working very hard, little Miss Inner Critic, so <laughs> feel free to take a long extended around the world of vacation. Don't feel the need to come back anytime soon. I mean, I had these little conversations in my head. But that helped me to to say, okay, well, that's what's coming up. And I know that there's something inside that's wanting to protect me. This is coming from a place of fear and not wanting me to get hurt. And so, but how do I choose? Do I choose to go with this thought and obsess on this thought? Or can I choose to look at things from another perspective and this is like an inner dialogue that I had to have to move through some of that yeah I just think of her as she means well but she's completely misguided mm. <laughs> and I'm yeah, in charge that's a good way to say it yeah that's yeah. a very good way to say it yeah. very good way to say it so Wendy another challenge that comes up for a lot of women is they feel like maybe it's different faces and maybe a little bit different personalities, but it feels like they're always attracting, meeting, or picking the wrong men. Um, Mm -hmm. What what can a woman do about that phenomenon? Because I talk to women, and I know you do too, who just say, you know what, different names, different faces, but it seems like it's the same old thing ultimately in these relationships. She has a flavor, there's a flavor in there that he could be tall, short, any race, color, color of hair, size. But I'm betting in most cases these men all share the same flavor. And it could even be as simple as they have the same trait, that for some reason your chemistry is just going nuts for that trait. And it usually, what's underneath it, usually has something to do with showing he has strength. So I'm going to give you one of mine. My very, very favorite traits in a man mm-hmm. is arrogance. Oh, really? God, I love wow. it. I love an arrogant man. I do. <laughs> wow. <laughs> arrogance comes in all sizes. You know, yeah, and, I can and, imagine. Right? 
But if you think about it, arrogance, if he's going to be arrogant, he better have something to back that up. He better have some strength and knowledge <laughs> right. and skill and facility with things, right? So that the underlying piece to arrogance is still strength. And we're going to naturally be attracted to a man's strength. So what you want to find is what is that commonality? What is that trait? What is that piece? And stop it. Just, just, just stop, or figure out if it's the flavor enough that you that's that's. I don't want to say manageable, but it's so funny. The very first time Dave showed me his arrogance, he started apologizing profusely, and I said, "Oh no, 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 no! Bring it! <laughs> I, I like it! I like it! I like it!" But but part of what can help too is if you purposely date outside your type. And in the beginning, that doesn't seem like a very good idea because you need that chemistry and you need that attraction. But there are times when one can date outside their type and become attracted. He can become your type. So this mm-hmm. happens more for women than it does for men, by the way, that men can what we call grow on us. Now, not every yeah. man does, but some can. And so yeah. that's a really great sort of science experiment way to date. And it's one of the first things I did when I purposely started dating. I think it was my third or fourth uh, date. I put on my very first third, third date, second, second date, was an Internet date. And we, um, I put the parameters really wide because I lived in a small town at the time. And I just went by age and geography. And I dated all kinds of men who were – and also – that he had to have good judgment. You know, the mm-hmm. guy standing in front of the mirror flexing without his shirt on is not displaying good judgment to me, so I got to rule him out. A uh, really complicated mustache guy also got ruled out. But, you know, so there was the little judgment <laughs> things. But outside of the bad judgment... mustache. <laughs> yeah, complicated mustache guy. So outside <laughs> of what I considered showing bad judgment um, and geography <laughs> and age... Those were my three criteria, and nothing more. I went out with a handful of men that I would have never thought to go out with, that it would never be my type. And it was a really great science experiment because I did meet men who, yeah, they grew on me, and that could have been great because especially since they weren't my type to begin with, I could really be myself with them. So it opened things up a lot more naturally and easily because I had little to lose in the beginning. Mm. Yeah, I really like that. That's really interesting. So I want to ask you, we promised that we were going to share with the ladies on the call eight qualities women need in a man. So what are those? Well, I'm going to give you some of my favorites to look for. But before I do that, women really need to look for themselves. Like I talked about, I spent quite a lot of time figuring out who I was, and what qualities I most valued in a mate. So you want to look, do you need chivalry? Do you need your sex drives to match? Do you need the same sense of humor? Maybe you need to deal with challenges the same way, or maybe you need to deal with challenges not in the same way but in a compatible way, you know? So I would look at all that stuff, but I promise you eight, so I'm going to give you my favorite eight, okay? Oh, lovely. (laughs) What I would look for is... Does he have integrity? Does he Mm -hmm. like you? Not just hot for you, but does he like you? And and are you your favorite self when you're around him? Does he get to see your favorite self, the one that you'd express to your girlfriends and your best, closest friends and family? Does he make you feel safe? Is he kind? Does he make you feel beautiful? Can he comfort you? Does he empower you to be your best self? And most importantly, does he have your back? Mm. Yeah, wow. I mean, we could have a whole conversation around any one of those, right? Um, Yeah. A whole long conversation. And how did you you identify these eight? Were these some of the ones that came to the surface for you as you went through all of the dating experiences? How did these rise to the very top? Well, it's now that I'm 
in my relationship, it's what I value the most, but I was definitely looking at them before I was in relationship, and they were the most important to me. And all of the ones that I gave you on this call, hardly any of them can be detected on the first or second or third date. You know, women want to vet their guy that they're going to date to see if he's the right guy for her and is she going to waste her time getting herself dressed up and putting herself out and going out into the world. We can't vet for these qualities. Integrity and thinks you're beautiful and can you feel safe, that's only going to come after time and actions following words that he said, him him wooing you, dates on the calendar, him really stepping up. So they're really important, and you're not going to see it immediately. Mm-hmm. You're going to have to wait and see. And, and like you said, you want to create that space where he's leading and you're in the dance with him. So I don't mean you're, you know, he's leading and you're behind him. No, he's leading and you're following along in the dance. So you can see where he's leading you to. Because we're powerful. Women are powerful and we can make stuff happen. And we can cause a relationship to happen by pursuing and, and not creating that space. But it's in the creating the space to let him lead is where you're going to see all of these qualities show up, if they're there or not. Yeah, I almost think of it as being a sacred space because it's a space that allows you to really begin to vet a man to see if he is going to step into that space and step up for you to be your man. And if we if we overthink or obsess over the dates or we get too anxious and we interrupt that natural space by pursuing him or by trying to move things along, um, especially in the early stages, we can really sabotage that and we can even potentially take away a man's motivation. So I always think of this, and I may have said this before to some of my listeners, but and this is kind of a weird analogy, but I think it kind of applies here. Um, when my husband and I were in the UK in April, of course, they have the train systems that you take for transportation from city to city. And, and of course, they have these signs everywhere in the train stations that say, mind the gap, which mm-hmm. basically means don't fall off the platform into the train tracks while you're getting on and off the train or whatever. So mind the gap, right? Mm-hmm. And I think that this this phrase, mind the gap, applies to dating and relationships. You have to allow that space or that gap, mind the gap, be aware of that gap, but hold it as a sacred space and think of it as a a space that allows you to begin to see who a man is by how he steps into that space, whether or not he steps into that space, and how he shows up for you. Yes, absolutely. That was really beautifully said. Oh, well, thank you. So I really, really appreciate the eight qualities that you said too, Wendy, because I think they may not be some of the ones that would immediately come to the surface when we first think about things. But, for example, kindness, when you talked about kindness and being a person of integrity or high character, Sure, those might be on our radar, but sometimes, you know, when we just see a really hot guy or there's really hot chemistry, that may not be the first thing we're thinking about is how kind he is or whatever, right? You know what? You throw a little bit of money in there, too, on top of that hotness. Yeah, he can be kind of mean. (laughs) (laughs) If he's got over a million, you can live with mean. (laughs) <laughs> uh, yeah, except you might feel like you've earned every bit of that million dollars yes. over time, right? Every very penny. Hard pain. Yeah, every penny. <laughs> but having now been married to my husband for a little over nine years, I can tell you, wow, are those really big deals. Those are really big de- deals. And particularly, I went through a cancer journey um, about three and a half years ago, I was diagnosed with breast cancer, and my husband and I had only been married for under five years at that time. And I'll tell you what, I had never even imagined I would need someone in the way that I needed him. Mm-hmm. And he showed up for me in ways that just blew my mind. And his kindness and his love for me, and even 
seeing me as beautiful when I had a completely bald head were gifts that I will never forget having been given. And so, I mean, when you talked about these things, I just wanted to jump up and down and say, yes, yes, yes. This is really, really what you want at the end of the day if you want to be in a committed relationship with an amazing man. Yeah. And comfort and empowered and has your back so applies to a cancer journey. And it Mm -hmm. also so applies to running your business and having someone that has your back and empowers you and can comfort you when you're exhausted. And, and, And it applies to motherhood and it applies to everything. It applies to every part of your life where you need soothing and tenderness and the satisfaction of knowing you're not in this on your own. Mhm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, what a gift that is. Uh, what an amazing gift that is. Um and it's really for me that summarized so beautifully what love really is all about and I'm just so grateful that I like you was able to move through my journey though it had a lot of ups and downs and get that clarity and also get that sense of really believing that I could be loved and cherished and adored and was worthy of that and that I could be with someone who had these um, qualities that you were speaking of in a man because what a what an amazing gift that is in life. And, yeah, the the real handsome, sexy guy with a million dollars, if he doesn't have these other things, um, yeah, you're going to feel you're going to feel that over a period of time. It's like once that thrill and that um, early attraction wears off, you're going to feel like you're earning every penny of that million dollars, right? <laughs> yeah. A pretty high price to pay. It is. It is. So, Wendy, I want to thank you so much for being so generous in sharing your wisdom and your experience, and this has just been such a delight to spend this time with you. And I want to give you a chance to just give us kind of a parting thought or last piece of wisdom before we wrap up today. Sure. Thanks, Michelle. So if you're looking for your committed partner, if you want to be partnered, don't wait to date. Don't wait. We wait. One of the things we wait for is we wait to lose the weight. <laughs> if oh, yeah, I had that's waited, a big one. right? If I had waited to lose the weight, I would not be coupled at this point. That would not be the case. I had a good fifty to lose. I still do. So don't don't wait to lose the weight. You may never lose the weight. I have faith in you. You might, but then you know, don't wait. One of the things we worry about is that we can only attract the perfect one for us the one when we're at our prime single weight. And it's just not true. So don't let that be an excuse or wait until that work project is complete or your work is less busy or the children shift into a different program or your sister doesn't need you so much. The people in your life are always going to need you. Your work is always going to need you. You're always going to have projects. Your life is always going to be busy. And I promise you, if you don't wait and you get out there, all that efforting can totally be worth it. I would do another 121 first dates to get to my partner. I would. Mm. So don't wait. Yeah, and I would do the dating for decades to get to my husband. Yeah. <laughs> so all over again. It. Yeah. Yeah. So, Wendy, I want to thank you. This has been so much fun, and I want to also thank each of you for joining us for this conversation. So thanks so much again for being here with us today. And for now, Wendy and I are both sending you lots of love, blessings, and wishing you happiness as you invite, inspire, and ignite the relationship of your dreams with your right guy. Bye-bye for now.